Lord God, we bless you for everything that you're doing in this community. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and, Lord, for uh, your opening up your holy word to us week after week to train us and to prepare us uh, to stand for faith. And so, Father, we just ask this morning as we, as we sit under your teaching uh, that you would open our, our, our ears to hear your word. Father, you would open our ears to receive your word. And, Lord, would you open up our lives that we might live out your word. And in doing so, Lord, might we bring you honor and glory. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so, as I, I said just a few minutes ago, just in case you've forgotten, uh, did I tell you we just returned from 12 days <laughs> uh, in Israel? And, you know, you think that it, we weren't just in a country uh, we weren't just outside of Canada, but we were in the land of the birth, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, much of the, con the, the entire conference took place not far from the site of the resurrection. I mean, just thinking about that is powerful enough, let alone being there. Uh, it was an incredible time, and so for three days, or after three days of touring biblical sites in Galilee, uh, we attended the Global Anglican Future Conference uh, in Jerusalem. GAFCON 2018, we're told, was one of the largest Anglican gatherings in 50 years. It brought together 1,950 Anglicans from over 50 countries. It was incredible to be worshipping with that many people. Um, a unanimity of spirit, I think, was reflected throughout the conference. Uh, as we celebrated joyful worship, uh, we engaged in small group prayer, and we were inspired by presentations and seminars and networks. All around that theme that I posted up there, proclaiming Christ faithfully to the nations. Now, if we just stop there for a minute, in order to faithfully proclaim Christ, we need to be clear on exactly what the gospel is. And so let me ask you this morning, are you clear on what the gospel is? The gospel is the life-transforming message of salvation from sin and all of its consequences. And the center of the gospel is this one person, Jesus Christ. All that he's done through his perfect life, through his atoning death, uh, through his triumphant resurrection, and through his glorious ascension. The gospel confronts each one of us. It confronts each one of us in the midst of our confusion and our sin. But thankfully, it doesn't leave us there. And this is the best part. The gospel is both a declaration and a summons. And so by declaration, I mean it announces what God has done for us in Christ. And it calls us to repentance, calls us to faith, it calls us to submission to the Lordship of Jesus, all of which results in a grace-filled life. In other words, it's all about transformation. And so throughout this conference, throughout the five days, uh, we renewed our commitment to proclaim the gospel in our churches and in our world. But what we also talked about, and I, know, I think you know this very well, this is sometimes easier said than done. Largely because the gospel is increasingly coming under, under attack from both inside and outside the church. Right? Outside the church, the rise of secularism seeks to exclude God from all public discourse and to dismantle the Christian heritage of our nation, one piece at a time. I think this has been most obvious in the redefinition of what it means to be human, especially in the areas of gender and sexuality and marriage. Inside the church... False teachers are seeking to recast the gospel in order to accommodate the culture. 
resulting in what I like to call a hodgepodge of beliefs. A hodgepodge of beliefs that denies the uniqueness of Christ, the seriousness of sin, the need for repentance, and the final authority of the Bible as God's written word. Now, sadly, uh, this attack against the gospel, this isn't new. This isn't, you know, unique to 21st century. This goes right back to the very beginning. Goes right back to the early church. Over and over again in the New Testament, we are exhorted to stand firm in our faith and to not fall prey to false teaching. Just consider these verses, and the references are on your handout. 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. Even so, many will follow their licentious ways, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with deceptive words. Or 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, for the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. Or Ephesians 4.14, we must no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. These verses, and, and many, many more like them, are just as relevant today as they were when they were first written. And so to help us stand firm, to help us faithfully proclaim Christ in our current generation, our summer series will look at the lessons that we can learn from the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Now, if you were to open, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open to Revelation. It's the last book of the Bible. It is not the book of Revelations. It is the book of Revelation. There is but one, albeit a long one. John writes in chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. He says, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And that's quite a beginning. I mean, that's a book I want to read, if those are the first lines. The book of Revelation was written down by John, John, one of the sons of Zebedee. John, the disciple. John, the evangelist. John, the apostle. In exile on the island of Patmos in 95 AD. So approximately 60 years after the resurrection. And it was written as the result of a vision that he had from the Lord Jesus. Now this was a time of growing persecution of Christians under the emperor Domitian. It was also a time of doctrinal challenges and moral compromise in the church. As the last book of the New Testament, Revelation is perhaps the most misunderstood book in the entire Bible. Steeped in the imagery of apocalyptic writing, on first read it is very difficult to understand. But despite what people think, Revelation isn't just a doomsday prophecy about the end of the world. It is a glorious love story about the return of the king and the dawning of a new day of Jesus' glory and love for the whole earth. 
In the beginning of Revelation, John writes, it was the Lord's day. In other words, Sunday. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in the Spirit. And suddenly I heard a loud voice behind me, a voice that sounded like a trumpet blast. It said, write down what you see and send it to the seven churches. And as this revelation unfolds, John describes the Lord Jesus walking among seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. These candlesticks represent the seven churches in Asia Minor at that time, what is now modern-day Turkey. So the church in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the first three chapters of Revelation consist of Jesus' letter to these seven churches. Now, as pastoral messages, so what I mean by that is a letter from a shepherd to his sheep, as pastoral messages, these letters were meant to encourage the churches, not to condemn them. And so each contain a compliment, mention of the good things the churches have done to bless the Lord. They also contain a criticism, condemnation of the areas where the churches are in error or have grieved the Lord. And they also contain a command, a command about what the church needs to do to correct these errors. Now, if you think about it, these seven churches contained real people, just like us. Real people with real problems struggling to live the Christian life in the context of a very real world, a world that in most cases was hostile to everything they believed and everything they stood for. And although 2,000 years separate us from them, their issues aren't much different from ours. And I believe that even though the Lord was writing to these seven churches... He's also speaking to us, to the church everywhere and throughout history because Jesus' words are timeless and eternal and they're always relevant. They're never outdated. There's no expiration date on the word of God. Now, I'm not sure if you caught this, but there are seven letters, seven churches, seven stars, seven lampstands. The number seven, as I think you all know, is the Hebrew number of completion or perfection. So in this context, I think it suggests that every condition of the church, along with the spiritual condition of the heart of every believer, and the relationship that we have with Jesus at any given point in time, can be found somewhere in these seven letters. They're like a mirror, right? These seven letters are like a mirror that we can hold up to see the truth about ourselves and about our church. It can help us see the truth about our life, our faith, our spiritual health, our relationship with Jesus and with each other. And so Jesus' words in these letters speak the same lessons, they carry the same warnings, and they offer the same promises to the church today, to us, to the people of Living Waters, Anglican Fellowship Kingston, within the Anglican Network in Canada, the Anglican Church in North America, the world, the universe, and beyond. And so as we study these seven letters, I encourage us to ask ourselves, to ask ourselves as as individuals and as a church community, if the Lord Jesus were to write a letter to us today, the Lord Jesus were to write a letter to Living Waters Anglican Fellowship, what would he say? How would he praise us? 
What rebuke might he offer? What encouragement, what warning might he give? These are important questions, I think, for us to consider. And so I want to begin this morning by looking at Jesus' letter to the first church, to the church in Ephesus that Annie uh, just read for us. So if you were to look on your handout, there's a map of the early church there for you. Ephesus was in the western part of Asia Minor, at the mouth of the Caister River. It was one of the largest, wealthiest, and most impressive cities in the ancient world. And I've circled it for you, I believe, on the map. Now, what you can't really see from the map is that Ephesus was located on a great highway. And so travelers from Rome to the east would pass through Ephesus, making this city a political, religious, and commercial hub. Ephesus also boasted one of the largest seaports in the area. It was a major player in trade between the eastern world and the western world. And in the center of this great city was the temple of Artemis, the Roman goddess of love and fertility. And the book of Acts tells us that during his third missionary journey, the Apostle Paul spent two years establishing the church in Ephesus with the help of Priscilla, Aquila, Apollos, and Timothy. And you can read about that uh, in the book of Acts. But even more important than that was that the birth of the church in Ephesus provided a home base from which to evangelize all of the provinces of Asia. So Ephesus was crucial for the spread of the gospel in all of that area. And so we read in Acts 19 and 20, so the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. And that all happened from Ephesus. Now by the time John was writing Revelation, an entire generation had passed since the founding of this early group of believers. And with the passing of those first converts came a cooling in the fervor and intensity of the Ephesians' faith. The victories that those pioneering Christians in Ephesus had won by labor and sacrifice and endurance became the accepted privileges that their children now enjoyed. They sort of had a little bit of entitlement about them. So let's take a look at what Jesus has to say to this church. First of all, the compliment. The compliment. Verses 2 to 3 reads, I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you do not tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Now what I love about this verse is it tells us that Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. Right? Jesus knew everything there was to know about the church in Ephesus. There was nothing that they could hide from him. There was nothing that they could keep secret. He knew everything. And just as he knew everything about the church in Ephesus, Jesus knows everything about the church today. He knows everything about Living Waters Anglican Fellowship. We're not hiding anything from him. Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for three things. First of all, he commends them for their toil and hard work. The Greek word here is kopos. Kopos literally means to engage in excessive labor of the type and intensity that brings grief and sorrow. So in other words, they're not just merely working a little bit. These people are toiling so hard for the gospel, toiling so hard for the Lord Jesus that it actually brings grief and sorrow. The Ephesians 
were willing to get their hands dirty for the gospel. In fact, they worked to the point of physical and emotional exhaustion. And why do you think they did that? Well, I suspect it's because the Ephesians understood that everything they did, they did for the Lord Jesus. Everything. And so therefore, because everything they did was for the Lord Jesus, everything they did desired their best. 100%. All that they were. Paul writes in Colossians 3.23, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. The Ephesians had this mindset. Everything they did, they did as if they were working for the Lord and not just for people. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any information. I mean, maybe they had an active ministry to the youth who hung around downtown Ephesus. Or maybe they ran a food bank or a shelter or had an outreach ministry to widows and orphans. Maybe they had a ministry to all of the tourists and travelers who had passed through the city on their ways to destinations east and west. I mean, we don't know for sure. What we do know is they did it, and they did it well. They did it as if they were doing it for the Lord. The question is, can the same be said of the church today? Does the church today do everything as if it is doing it for the Lord. And more importantly, can the same be said of living waters? Do we do everything as if we're doing it for the Lord? Or are there some things we kind of do for ourselves? We live in a fast-paced, busy world where most people, regardless of their age or stage, are so overcommitted, so busy, that at the end of the day, they flop down on the couch and they have very little energy to devote to ministry, let alone to anything else. And so as a result, many churches are struggling. Many churches are struggling because they don't have enough people willingly to do the work and ministry of the church. Or it's the old 20-80 principle. 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. James puts it very clearly. James says in verse 22 of chapter 1, he says, But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. So there's a link between hearing and doing. Now, I don't ask us this to make us feel guilty. I ask us this to take an honest look at our hearts. But this was not the case in Ephesus. Jesus is very clear here. The Christians in this city weren't just hearers of the word. They were also doers. And so he commends them for their work. Number two, he condemns the Ephesians for the way they patiently endured and had not grown weary in a culture that was largely opposed to the gospel. He commends them for their steadfastness. He commends them for their patience, despite external pressures. Paul writes in Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, Let us not get tired, let us not grow weary of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. How often have you grown weary of doing good? There have been days when I have grown weary, when I've thrown myself a little pity party and said, I've done too much. I've done too much good. And when I think that, I need to come right back and say, shame on you. Shame on you. Paul is very clear here. Let us not get tired. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us constantly turn to the Holy Spirit, who is our strength, to empower us 
and to enable us. Let us not grow tired of doing good. Can the same be said of the church today? Can the same be said of living waters? Are we working tirelessly for the gospel? Do we stand boldly for Jesus, boldly for the truth, and faced in the face of indifference, resistance, opposition? Or are we overwhelmed by the obstacles in our path? And do we shrink back in the face of opposition? Jesus commends them for their patient endurance. And number three, he commends them for not tolerating false teaching. For not tolerating false teaching. Acts 20, verses 29 to 31, Paul writes, or Paul says, Luke writes, I know that fierce wolves will come to you after I leave, and they will not spare the flock. Some of your own men will come forward and say things that distort the truth. They will do this to lure disciples into following them. So be alert. Remember that I instructed each of you for three years, day and night, at times with tears in my eyes. After three years of pouring himself out, In this new church, Paul is preparing to leave Ephesus. And so he tells the elders with whom he left this church in care of, he tells them to stay alert, to stay on guard, to watch over their flock. And according to Jesus here, that's exactly what they did. Right? They tested all of the teachers who followed after Paul. And they compared the teaching of these teachers to what Paul said. One such group that Jesus mentions specifically in this letter is the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Now, this was a sect of believers within the early church who tried to make compromises between the pagan way of life and the gospel. And so they tried to blend what Paul taught them And some of the pagan rituals that they'd come out of, they tried to blend them together. In other words, they were trying to let the Ephesians have their cake and eat it too. They were watering down the gospel. They taught that freedom in Christ meant that a person could sin, a person could do whatever they wanted without consequences, but because they've already been forgiven. This is a theology of cheap grace. Paul addresses this very clearly in his letter to Roman to the Romans and elsewhere. Jesus commends the Ephesians here for their integrity, refusing to abide evil people, evil teachings, and evil behavior. The church at Ephesus set themselves apart as a holy congregation, struggling to remain unstained and pure unstained by the world outside and by the false teachers inside. And that's pretty much the genesis of living waters, isn't it? If you think about it. But we still need to ask ourselves, how are we as individuals and a church testing those who might seek to lead us astray? Do we know exactly what we believe and why? And are we able to articulate that belief clearly? Do we accept what we read in the news as truth just because it lines up with popular opinion or popular views in the culture? Or do we hold everything up against Scripture as the measure, as the final authority? hard-working, persevering, discerning. All for the glory of God. These are outstanding marks for any church. And I am sure, as that letter was being read for the first time, the Ephesians must have felt pretty good about themselves. But something was missing. Something very important. Something essential to the life 
growth, and effectiveness of the church at Ephesus. This leads to my next point, the criticism. Jesus says in verse 4, remember, he's just said all this good stuff. He says in verse 4, but I have this against you. I suspect as the reader was reading that, an uncomfortable silence fell over the congregation in Ephesus. Can you imagine Jesus saying that to you? But this I have against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Some translations render this, but this I have against you. You have lost your first love. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, the Greek word here for lost or left or abandoned, whatever Bible translation you're working with, it's the same in the Greek. The Greek word is aphemi. It means to forsake, to lay aside, to leave, omit, or send away. To forsake, to lay aside, to leave, omit, or send away. In other words, the Ephesians had been faithful in doctrine. The Ephesians had been faithful in deed, but their hearts were calloused. They had forgotten the Lord. They'd lost their first love. They'd lost their love for Jesus, and they'd lost their love for each other. Jesus was no longer number one in the church and in their lives. Somehow, in the midst of all of their godly busyness, Somehow, in the midst of standing firm for the truth, somewhere along the lines, the Ephesians had left Jesus behind. And if you can't love the Lord, you cannot love each other. They go hand in hand. And so the church in Ephesus is a powerful example to us. It shows us that you can be faithful to the church. It shows us you can be active in ministry. You can read your Bible every day and you can pray up a storm and still not love Jesus. But the reality is all of our activities, all of the worship that we do, all of the ministry that we do, all of the prayers that we offer without a love for Jesus, they're all empty. They're all worthless. They're all meaningless. Or to quote Isaiah, they're all dirty rags. If Jesus is not at the center, we have nothing. Remember what what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, without me, you can do nothing. Despite everything that the Ephesians did well, despite their ministry, despite their doctrinal purity, despite their strength and their faithfulness, Jesus describes them as a fallen church. Their service to him had become mechanical. Their worship routine and their devotion empty. Can the same be said of the church today? Can the same be said of living waters? I think Jesus is challenging us this morning to take an honest look at our spiritual lives. To examine our hearts and to see if we've allowed the things of this world to draw us away from him. Have we lost our first love? Have our hearts grown cold? Let me give you a few questions to ponder. I think they're on your sheet, so you might want to ponder them later when you have more time. Now, this is between you and God, right? This is is heart to heart. Why are you here this morning? Are you here because of your love for the Lord and your love for your Christian brothers and sisters? Are you here to express that love in worship? Or are you here because that's something that you do on Sunday morning?
How is your time in the Word outside of Sunday mornings? Are you reading Scripture daily, occasionally? Not at all. Are you actively involved in ministry using the gifts and the talents and abilities that the Lord has blessed you with? Is your service, whatever it is, inside and outside the church, is it an expression, an outpouring, an outflow of your love for Jesus? Or is it another task on your to-do list? A way to keep busy? Or a way to feel good about yourself? Be honest. I mean, this is between you and the Lord. Has your love grown cold? Or have you lost your first love? Jesus' warning here isn't just for Christians in first century Ephesus. It's for us. Simply put, Jesus is saying it's not enough to be caring, giving, diligent in serving, sound in doctrine. It's not enough to go to church if your affection for me has grown cold. Now again, I'm not asking these questions to heap guilt or shame on any of us. I'm asking these questions so that we can act proactively, search our own hearts, and get a sense of where we're at. Psalm 73, 25 reads, Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. In Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched, and weary land where there is no water. Can you say the same thing? Is your soul parched? Are you weary for the Lord? Are you diligently seeking Him? Is Jesus your first love? So what were the Ephesians to do about all this? But how were they to reboot if you will, or fire up their love for Jesus. Well, this leads to the third part, the command. Verse 5 reads, Remember then from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. Remember then from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. Having commended the Ephesians for their faithful work, chastise them for having a diminished love for them for him jesus gives them a threefold command to right the wrong he doesn't just leave them hanging right he wants to restore them so number one he says remember remember perhaps their failure had been so gradual they didn't even see it the decline so slight over the years they they didn't notice the change from day to day But at the end of a generation, the difference between their first love and their current love was glaringly obvious. And so Jesus wanted them to acknowledge just how far they'd fallen. The Greek word here is nemoneu. It means to call to mind constantly, to recollect, to rehearse, to be mindful to call to mind constantly, recollect, rehearse, or be mindful of. Jesus is commanding the Ephesians to remember and never forget the grace of God from which they've come. Paul explained this grace to them in his letter 30 years before. Paul writes, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is by grace that you have been saved. 
often we want a quick fix, don't we? Right? We, we want a quick prayer that will make everything better. We don't want to go through the pain that's involved in healing and reconciliation. We want everything to be instantly okay. However, we don't regain our first love overnight. Ask any married couple who have had a marital crisis. Right? A marriage doesn't deteriorate overnight, and nor is it restored overnight. Healing takes time. And the same is true in our spiritual life. It takes small, intentional, faith-filled, humble steps to return to God. And the more we walk in the right direction, the more we walk out of darkness and into the blazing light of his love, the more we walk towards him, the more he runs towards us. And this process begins by remembering who Jesus is and what we once had. So we remember. Number two, we repent. Now, call it what you will, but failing to love Jesus is sin. And God commands us to repent of sin, of missing the mark, of falling short of his glory, of violating his holy standard. He commands us to repent of thinking, saying, or doing anything that is inconsistent with his character or his word. The Greek word here, metneo, means to change your ways. We've looked at this word many times. To change your ways, to turn from your sins, to change your attitude. Now, repentance isn't just recognizing and admitting you've done something wrong. It's not just saying sorry. Repentance isn't a 90-degree turn with, with an eye on two different directions, where you've been and where you hope to go. And repentance isn't a 360-degree turn, right? Moving in the opposite direction, only to return where you once were, which is often what happens. Repentance is a 180-degree turn. Did I get my math right? Okay. It's a complete turning of one's actions, one's mind, and moving in the opposite direction. In other words, moving away from sin or coldness of heart and to God and the passion the Holy Spirit gives us. Jesus, or sorry, Paul says to Timothy, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Repentance is fleeing from sin, pursuing Jesus, and a Christ-like character. And so he says, remember what you had, repent of what you've done, and repeat this over and over again. This is a call to action, a call to do those things they did when they first met Jesus, when they first came to faith. It's a call to confess their need for him and their desire to have him in their life. It's a call here for commitment to worship, to adoration, to prayer, to service, all in Jesus' name. It's a call to make Jesus number one. Genuine repentance always brings fruit in keeping with that repentance. And so Jesus is calling the Ephesians to produce healthy fruit again, to do those things that originally set them apart from the world around them. He gives them three commands and he gives them a warning. He says, if they do not heed them, he will come and remove their lampstand from its place among the churches. And sadly, that is exactly what happened. If you were to travel to the site of the ancient city of Ephesus today, it's still there in modern-day Turkey. You can go see it. All that you would find in that once great city are ruins. Ruins of a once great city and ruins of a once great church. Ephesus has ceased to exist. Jesus removed its lampstand. Although he is speaking to the church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, 
addressing their specific context, Jesus is also speaking to us this morning. He's asking us to ask ourselves, do you love me? Do I love Jesus? That's the question before us this morning. Is my heart burning hot? Or is my heart burning cold? Is it a casual love? Or is it a deep love? filled with passion and power and unwavering commitment. The message to the church in Ephesus ends with this promise. To everyone who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This promise is simple. If we are faithful in this life, if Jesus is our first love, if we stand for truth, we will know him intimately in the next life. And friends, I want us to claim this promise for ourselves this morning. Each of these seven letters ends with the same sentence. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. This morning, the risen Jesus stands in our midst and he asks us, do you have ears to hear? Or are you too distracted by the noise of the world? Friends, God is speaking to us this morning. Are you listening? Amen.